people talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence as, as if it's something that's happening or it's going to happen in the future, it's coming. But really, it's already here, and it's already playing just a huge role in every person's life you know, today. Hi, this is Eric Jones. I'm joined today here with David Michelle Davies, the CEO of the Webby's. Uh, the Webby's well, well regarded as you know one of the most prestigious awards that anybody can get for their websites, um, and hailed as the Oscars uh, for work online. It's good to have you here. David. Thanks for having me. Michelle. I appreciate it. Um, you're just coming off a period of time where you've been uh, reviewing submissions. You've been doing your uh, your famous talks with various agencies around the world. I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the trends and some of the things that you've seen, both from you know that research that you do and also from the conversations that you've been having with with agencies around the world. You know, I think one thing we really focused on this year specifically was trying to get a better understanding of the role that automation, uh, the role that machine learning and artificial intelligence is sort of like an overall concept is starting to have not only on the internet, but also in our lives in general. Uh, so it's been super fascinating. We did a whole bunch of research. Uh, we went out and talked to you know dozens, if not hundreds of companies about it um, and learned quite a bit. And I think our biggest takeaway, what we, sort of as a synopsis is, people talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence as, as if it's something that's happening or it's gonna happen in the future, it's coming. But really, it's already here, and it's already playing just a huge role in every person's life, you know, today. You know, not just really high-tech people who are working on the internet, but all of our mothers and brothers and sisters who are working all sorts of other non-tech jobs too. So it's playing a big influence. So it was really fascinating to learn about that and uh, research it. Yeah, we had done, uh, you know, a survey on on Gen Z, and one of the big things that we found was. You know, overwhelmingly, that generation wants more personalization. You know, across the board in their daily lives. Um, you know, AI is obviously going to be instrumental in sort of powering those more personalized experiences. Um, do you have any great examples of of personalization that you've seen, or you know, you gave the the KFC situation? Um, maybe another way of putting it is is how do you think you know websites will begin to change as you know, AI becomes more a part of that web experience. Um, and as it starts to power more and more things like voice, you know, as a part of a website. Yeah, well, I mean, we've been thinking a lot about what websites are going to be in the future. And I think one of the interesting things about a website is uh, it's really, at the end of the day, it's an interface is really what a website is. You know, and I think people think of websites as like these destinations that we used to surf and go to. And that's true. But really, it's it's an interface for an information or for an application or for a tool um, or for some sort of technology that helps you do something. And I think one of the things we're going to start to see, and we're starting to see already, is this huge impact that voice is going to start to play. And so that instead of needing to go and fire up a computer, you might start asking information from whatever voice assistant you're using. And ultimately, that voice assistant is just going to, and we're seeing this today, whether people are using uh, Google Home or Alexa or whatever they're using, um, those devices or those services are really just looking up information on Wikipedia and all these different places. So you really start to think of like, what is a website when you're not going to visit it, but you're having some sort of assistant, which is essentially at the end of the day, a machine, look at the website for you. And so you have basically two machines talking to each other. And the important part about a website that we think about is that interface of the nav and how you get there. But the machines use two totally different interfaces to talk to each other. So I think that's super fascinating. And then uh, just to sort of add to that, what I think in terms of websites, which is really interesting, is everybody already, um, especially people who like use WordPress, can make their content on websites machine readable. And so it's not this thing, again, it's not this thing that's in the future, that one day, if your company's big enough, you'll have the ability to create information that can be, you know, browsed and looked at by these other machines. Even today, if you have a WordPress-enabled website, there's all sorts of tools. I know WordLift's one that we focused on that allows your content to be machine readable and already be in that thing. So again, this stuff is happening right now, which was the, the fascinating part for us, I think. We were talking about voice, um, and one of the, I think, interesting applications of voice is it will allow agencies and various creatives to, you know, come up with digital experiences uh, that are different based on a person's emotion behind the voice. Um, so angry, sad, whether there's an urgency behind the voice. Are you beginning to see anybody begin to tackle this and, and begin to serve up those types of uh, you know, experiences? 
Um, you know, it's interesting. I have, we, I have not seen anything yet, and it's something we've been talking about a lot, because I think that there's a, there's a really big opportunity in voice that is, as of yet, as far as I can tell, untapped, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, for most people that are going to experience technology through voice right now, it's going to be through one of these smart speakers. Uh, and ultimately, these smart speakers even today don't recognize different voices. So, for instance, if you and your wife or your husband or whatever, your partner, are at home and you're both using speakers, right now the, the speakers cannot tell the difference between one and the other. Um, the other thing is the voice, the interaction, the interface is always the same voice. So Alexa always has the same voice. So if I go to Burger King or Wikipedia or whatever, Amazon using Alexa or Google at home or whatever it is, the voice is always the same that talks to me, right? And so there's this incredible flattening of the brand Right, where normally you would go to Google.com or Amazon or McDonald's or whatever you're gonna, whatever sites you're gonna go to, there's this whole brand experience there. When you get into voice right now, there really isn't a brand experience, right? And so I think the huge opportunity is what brands are gonna be able to figure out how to, how are brands gonna figure out how to create an experience through that, uh, through that interface? It's really challenging, but it's a big opportunity. We're not seeing anybody really doing that. And that's gonna be, a, that's a big differentiator, right? If you can have an experience vis-a-vis -vis Alexa that's unique and different um, to other experiences in a world where, like I said, 99% of the experience are essentially the same right now. Um, that's going to be a big deal. You know, taking a step back a little bit from voice and, and applying it more broadly, you know, people are inundated by more content, you know, each and every day. You know, branded content now is a major, major thing. Um, you know, and a lot of it actually, I would argue, very, very good. Um, what do you think is necessary? You know, what are the things that successful brands are doing to kind of cut through the clutter, cut through the noise, and deliver something of, of, of value to their, their customers and, and, and users? Yeah, well, I think one thing when you talk to young people that they'll talk about, which I find very interesting, right, which is young people consume content uh, in a time-shifting way, right? So they're watching Netflix or Hulu or they're watching branded content on the web. Very, very much less frequently than older generation people, my generation, are they watching, you know, NBC or whatever channel at nine o'clock and watching ads. And when you actually take young people and you put them in front of something like the Olympics, where all of a sudden that's where they're going to watch that and that there's these ads that come on, it's like they run away from that, right? Because the improvement that agencies and the world at large has made in advertising via branded content is just enormous. Like you take the branded content that's out there today, it is so good. Now, a lot of it's still an advertisement, maybe you don't like advertisements or whatever it may be, but the quality is exceptional. It's very, very content-based, it's very, very story-based, there's lots of information in it. Um, it tends to align with not just the product itself, but something that's meaningful to the people. So if it's a soap commercial, soap branded content, it's about values that the, the, the brand has that relate to its customer. I mean, it's much, much more uh, deep than a 30 second ad, right? But now you put these people who've been in this world of branded content consumers, you put them in the Olympics. Now all of a sudden they're watching 30 second ads again. It's like, what is this stuff that they're showing me? And they're like muting it and turning it off. So just to illustrate the point that we have really improved dramatically the quality of marketing like in the world in the last, you know, 10 years, I'd say. Um, and so I think that's a really impressive thing. Now the thing is though, is that, every, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, only the top brands, only the people who were really innovative, only the people at the front, at the forward, leaning people were really making this stuff. So it was actually easy for them to have a really big impact because nobody else was doing it. Now everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. And so now the thing is, well, if everybody out there, if the playing field has been totally level set, how do we continue to make really great branded content that cuts through and talks to people? Um, one of the wonderful things that the Webby's does is, in fact, your Webby for Good program. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and, and what you're doing uh, to celebrate some, some of the social good work that's being done by the agencies around the world. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think what we've recognized as part of the, I think it's a great second and a great add on here to your question, sort of ties in well, is that. Uh, no matter what category of marketing or work you might be, so you might be working in healthcare or you might be working in transportation or you might be working in sports or something, what we found was that there were a lot of uh, experiences, whether those are websites or digital or uh, mobile or sort of combined things, that had a you know, social good or a good angle to them. And so we wanted to recognize that not by just saying, hey, let's have a social good category, 
because then that sort of that just minimizes everything to this one category. But instead, say, let's look across all the things the Webby Award honors websites, which we started with, but also now video and social and mobile and uh, games and podcasts, and pull out and showcase all the work that's um, done for social good. And so people can go to our site. Uh, we have a big thing on the homepage about it. You can look at the Webby for Good. It's a program we're doing with WP Engine. We'll be doing again this year. Uh, we're excited about. And I think that uh, it's been a really great place for marketers and for internet professionals also to go to see and learn about how other brands and companies are doing social good work as part of their normal work. You know, not just as like a side thing as a charity, but as, as a really integrated part of what they stand for and what their brand's about. You, uh, you mentioned gaming. Uh, there's been an explosion in that particular segment of the Webby Awards over the last year. Um, I think you added a whole slew of new categories. Um, you know, could you talk about some of the amazing creative work that's being done in, in that area uh, today and, and, you know, just sort of capture for our audience, um, you know, some of the best that, that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'll, last year the one of the big winner in the gaming category was Pokemon Go, which is probably not surprising. Um, a lot of people, we, I, uh, we traveled a lot this year doing a lot of this research. And what I found is even though I know, because I know the people at Pokemon Go, and I know how many, probably not how many, but I know that it is a, it's a very, very mass reach game. A lot of people play Pokemon Go. A lot of adults play Pokemon Go. Um, interesting enough, a lot of adults don't want to say that they play Pokemon Go. But when you find out about the impact of that game, what it actually does, um, people by like the tens of thousands move and go places physically because of that game, right? It's a really new phenomenon. I think back in the day we saw some of that with like sort of checking things, like geolocation things, ca you know, caching and Foursquare and stuff like this. But, you know, they don't do this, but literally they could put some super fancy Pokemon outside of, you know, uh, a voting booth and there'd be like 50,000 people there if they wanted to, you know? And so that's a really new thing. And I think, that was something we wanted to really start recognizing. We recognized Pokemon specifically last year, Pokemon Go, but it's just overall saying, look, there's, you know, 350 million people here in the United States. There's seven, eight billion people all over the world. At this point, more than the majority of them have phones in their pockets. All these phones also enable them to play games and have geolocated experiences. Um, and so it seems like a really important thing that's happening in the world that we wanted to recognize. Right. Um, you know, we saw the uh, FCC sort of turn back on, on, net neutrality. Um, what's your perception on how that may impact creatives and creative work and you know how it may ultimately impact internet users? Well, I think the sort of the ultimate kernel of the internet that made it work and so successful and I think that what we all celebrate and get excited about um, was it essentially democratized like everything, right? And so at the very, very early days, it just meant that anybody could publish a web page and put it up and other people could find it. That was a very, very different thing. There was no way to personally publish something before like the 1990s, basically, that anybody in the world could look at. Extremely new. And then you started to see that same concept applied to other media, to video. Suddenly people could publish their own shows and their own podcasts and all these things. And the reason for that is basically because it was essentially very, very inexpensive to publish that and have people find it. And so I think our take at the Webby Awards is that that fact has made this whole thing explode. And the guy who invented the web and the guy who invented the internet and the guy who invented, you know, all these people all think that this big change in the net neutrality rules is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And we also have like this 20 plus years of history that we did it this other way that was pretty successful. So we, we don't think it's a good idea to change the rules. And what we're scared of is that the kid who's 12 years old today and has a great idea in five years and is in their so-called garage or whatever that ends up being in the future, their great idea won't have the ease of which to travel to the rest of the universe and eventually be the Facebook or the HQ on a funnier font side or whatever the thing is that you love or we all love, right? And so I, that's just something we are, think is something to be careful of. And hopefully hopefully the, the our policymakers in Washington will, will see the light. Any advice for agencies hoping to win a Webby Award? I think, look, at the end of the day, it's, it's still really about making really, really great work. Uh, it's about telling really great stories, all the cliches are true, you know? Um, but I think the thing that's different at the Webby Awards is it's also about figuring out how those great stories and that great work interacts with people and how people can interact with it in a really meaningful and human way. That it's not just something you push out to people, 
that people actually find it, like it, do something to it on their own, change it, and share it with people. And I think if you look at really like all the history of the things that have been the most successful, whether at the Web Awards or just generally on the internet, um, it's stuff that people have found and made their own and shared with their friends. Um, and so I think that's it's it's pretty simple, but it's still the core. I think. Appreciated having you on on uh, today, David Michelle. Thank uh, you. Thanks for having me. Chatting with you in the future. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it.